thanks for that, Julie. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for coming to, to hear this subject. Well, in this International Year of Biodiversity, it's fitting, I think, that we should consider the beetles, which are the most diverse group of animals on Earth. And I think that's a widely appreciated thing. And my first slide is grabbed from the internet. And I think it's in the Natural History Museum, London, where they've got this title, An, an Inordinate Fondness for Beetles. And it comes from a quote, uh, J.S.B. Haldane, a geneticist and um, bi evolutionary biologist, was asked by a theologian what the study of natural science could tell us about the creator. And Haldane responded that if indeed there had been a, cur a, a creator, that he had an inordinate fondness for beetles and stars. Now, I don't think there are as many beetle species as there are stars, but how many, whoop, go back a bit, how many are there? And I had to turn to the CSIRO's entomology website to get an answer there, an up-to-date estimate, and they reckon that in the world there are 360,000 described species of beetles, and 23,000 of those are in Australia. Of course, if you include the undescribed species, you're probably looking at four times those numbers. So there are a hell of a lot of them. And by virtue of their great uh, diversity and their numbers, they are of great importance to humanity and to ecosystems. So for humanity, of course, uh, many of them are pests. So we've got grain weevils and carpet beetles and uh, cockchafer grubs that eat our pastures. But on the positive side of the ledger, beetles have major roles to play in the maintenance of ecosystems, along with um, all the other insects, of course. So prime there is that they are part of the food chain. They provide food for lots of other animals. Um, many of them are grazers. They feed on various parts of plants, so they're helping control plant growth and propagation so they don't become weeds and choke environments. Some are pollinators, um, those that visit flowers, and others are recyclers of dead plant material. So with the beetles, of course, we can think of dung beetles that are recycling dung, and that's important to us as well. Now, in this talk, I'll be revealing yet another role. It's comparatively minor in relation to those other four big ones, but still, it's another role for beetles. And uh, I can't give you um, general coverage of the beetles because of their huge diversity. And instead, I'm focusing on a group of beetles, which, which I'm calling earth borer beetles, for want of a better term. And they're called earth borers because, funnily enough, they bore in the earth. And here are some of their workings, the surface signs of their workings anyway. These little heaps of soil, and you often find them scattered on um, sandy ground, especially after heavy rain. Now they're formed as the, the beetles burrow down into the ground. Oh, I was going to say they're often single and scattered, but sometimes you get dense aggregations of them. And here's a close-up of one of these so-called push-ups. So the beetles are burrowing down and loosening the sand, and every so often they'll back up with a big load of sand and because the sand is damp, they're pushing this damp mass up the burrow and it comes up like toothpaste out of a tube and then it will fall over to the side and remain as a discrete lump. But not all push-ups look like that. Some have an open entrance and the, the um, spoil is scattered around it. Now, if you were able to go down one of those burrows, you might come face to face with the occupant. This is a fairly typical earth borer beetle at the business end. And on the head is a long horn, on the thorax a pair of smaller horns. So this is where the, uh, the horny beetles part of my title comes from. And I hope you won't feel that you've been duped and you've been expecting a talk about beetle sex because I'm hardly even going to mention the word. <laughs> but there's great variety among these beetles. Um, this is similar, but another species, slightly bigger horns on the thorax. Females generally lack the horns, so the horns, we can presume, are involved in male-male contests for um, 
access to females, but there have been no studies on that aspect as yet. Um, the form of the horns varies greatly from one species to another, and so they're nice animals to identify, at least the males are, because of the characteristic horns. Here's a, a selection. We've got a, a male at the top there, and it's female below, but they're two different species on the right with really curious headgear. Now these are powerful flyers, but they fly mainly at night. And um, they're quite noisy when they fly too. You can hear them coming from the distance. And if you were to be out camping with a lantern on at night, um, it's quite possible that if there has been recent rain, that one or more will come flying into your camp light and crash into something. And if they do have a rough landing, they're likely to emit a, a sound, a squeaking sound. That's a noise that they make when they're handled or annoyed in some way. So if they hit something, it's like uh, they're saying, geez, what hit me? Now, the earth borer beetles are related to the scarab beetles. They're not in the family Scarabidae, but here are some of the relatives. You might be more familiar with some of these. So we've got a cockchafer beetle here, some Christmas beetles, um, a flower beetle, a pretty day-flying scarab, um, the dung beetle, common dung beetle, and a relative of the lawn beetles. They're called rhinoceros beetles quite commonly. So um, a number of scarabs have horns that are quite similar to the earth borers, but I'll explain the differences in the next slide, I think, yes. Um, Perhaps I should go back and start with the antennae. The um, scarabs in general are good burrowers and long antennae would be a hindrance, so they're short antennae. If we look at the lower right, um, these are the antennae here and each antenna has a little club on the end. So that's characteristic of the scarab group broadly. And also um, the front legs are rather spiny, so up here we can see the front a spiny part of the leg, that's what they dig with when they're getting into the earth. Anyway, the earth borer beetles have just three segments in their club and they're thick segments that form a ball or an egg shape structure, so they're much larger than the clubs on other scarab beetles. Um, this is a, an illustration of the maximum number of expansions on the end of the antenna in, uh, I think, some kind of cockchafer but we needn't worry about that right now. Now just to look at the classification very briefly, uh, we can think of classification as putting things in boxes and the smaller boxes in the bigger boxes. So the green box represents this scarab-like beetles called scarabioidea. And so here's the, the scarab family and next to it is the earth borer family, which in most textbooks um, is known as the Geotrupidae. So this is derived from Greek or Latin, geo, earth, and trupes, which means to burrow. And over here are a number of other families that go with them. But just as the family Scarabidae is subdivided into those that I showed you, um, so cockchafers and flower beetles, etc., the family Geotrupidae is subdivided there are some northern hemisphere beetles called door beetles, which are known to use dung. So um, for a long time, the geotrupids were thought to be dung beetles, and some Australians um, tended to reinforce that idea. But the group that we're going to be looking at today are in this subfamily, Bulbo serotini, and some recent authors have proposed removing that to a separate family just to complicate the picture. Now most of, most of what we know about earth borer beetles we can attribute to this gentleman, uh, Henry Howden, who used to be at the Colton University in Canada, but he's long been retired and he's now a senior citizen. But uh, he's still going and I've been in communication with him. Anyway, Henry was brought to Australia in the 1970s to undertake a revision of the earth borer beetles as part of the dung beetle program, because they thought, well, you know, we want to get dung beetles that can help us control cattle, lung and, blow fly and um, bush flies. So that was his task, was to uh, discover and describe the species and classify them. 
until he found them with bits of fungi. And many of his taxonomic papers say found in burrow with uh, bits of fungi. And he, he wasn't specific about what sort of fungi they were. But um, I did communicate with him and he said, well, they're underground fungi. Hypogeus, if you want to use the technical term, Hypogeus fungi, which um, in this lower group, um, these show fruiting bodies which don't open and release the spores. They're adapted to have animals eat them and the spores are distributed by the animals um, passing their spores through their intestines and, and they get passed in the droppings somewhere else. So it was possible that um, the beetles were eating those kinds of underground fungi. Now before uh, I go any further with the beetles, I just need to clarify a few things about fungi. When we talk about a fungus and we talk about a toadstool or a mushroom or a puffball, that's just part of the organism. It's not the whole thing. It's really just a fruiting body, like a fruit on a tree is not the whole tree or the whole plant. So the, the vegetative part of a fungus is called the mycelium and that's really just a network of very fine threads that um, ramify through some substrate and in terms of the soil um, they live amongst the sand grains or soil grains. But at some point in their growth they develop a fruiting body or sporocarp which is the equivalent of the fruit as I say and that produces the spores which are the equivalent of seeds in um, vascular plants. Now some of those fungi, in fact a great number of the fungi that are growing in the soil are termed mycorrhizal and that means that they form associations with plant roots and it's a symbiotic relationship, a two-way relationship where the fungus gains from the association and the plant also does. The fungus receives carbohydrates from the plant roots and the plant receives nutrients from the soil that it might not otherwise get because the, the mycelium of the fungus, the fine threads, act like an extension to the root system. So mycorrhizal fungi are very important to the health of much of our flora. And quite a bit of work has been done on the biology of mycorrhizal fungi. Um, this is one of Neil Bowger's, uh, the mycologist at the Western Australian Herbarium, one of his photos showing um, a fairly typical kind of truffle. Now truffle, most people know them as the edible food items, but we've got lots of native truffles. Um, I don't know that anyone eats them, but they produce an odour which allows animals to find them under the soil and dig them up and eat them. And they're a rich source of lipids or fats. Now, uh, marsupials such as potteroos and woilies are well known for their habit of digging up these uh, fruiting bodies and eating them. And Neil Bowger has been involved in studies looking at which particular truffles or fungi um, the mammals eat and the role that these ma marsupials play in distributing the spores. So it's, it's looking at an ecosystem um, system and how the health of an environment is maintained. But nobody had followed up on Howden's observations of the beetles doing the same thing and I thought that was worth doing. Now to the, the life cycles of the, the beetles, Howden was successful in finding the immature stages of only two out of 166 species during all that digging. He dug thousands of burrows in the years that he spent in Australia, but got information for only two. But what he learnt about them was, to me at least, quite fascinating. In the top left picture here we have a beetle, and on the left of it is its egg. They apparently produce just one egg at a time. And on the right of the beetle is the hatchling larva. So that hatches from an egg like so. It's almost large enough to produce a beetle. Now Henry had found the, the eggs in brood cells and here's one of his illustrations which shows a dark mass with a central cavity. And the dark mass, he said, is surface sand containing humus. And the humus is the food of the larva when it hatches, according to to Howden. Now uh, in many areas I've observed the beetles burrowing in yellow sand where there's 
no humus. And I thought, well, where are they going to get humus here? And I wanted the different beetles do different things. So it, I was just interested to dig up a brood cell um, of this kind and see what that dark material is because Henry had never um, examined it microscopically, microscopically. He just assumed that it was humus and it was the larval food. Uh, before moving on, I can just mention that the, the grub is very degenerate when you compare it to this one, which is a cockchafer grub. Uh, cockchafer larvae are free living. They've got to find their own food in the soil, so they're capable of burrowing, which they can do with their strong mandibles. They scoop with their, their head. They've got well-developed legs with claws on the end, and when they're feeding, they develop a big sack of uh, food in the abdomen. It's quite clear. You can see it through the body wall, the dark food material. But these are quite different, and if they live in a protected environment like a brood cell, well, you could understand they don't need to be equipped for moving around or chopping up anything large. So there were a number of things that I thought were worthy of study, and I thought it would be a pilot study, just a quick little thing I would do in one winter, and it sort of got away from me. So. The goals that I set out with were firstly to trial some methods of study to see how best to obtain the beetles, um, how best to study their habits, because I had tried to get this up as a student project or a couple of student projects, but nobody took the bait. Seemingly it was too risky and people might not get the results and students need to get results quickly so they can spend a lot of time analysing them. I wanted to clarify which kinds of fungi form the diet of the beetles to see whether maybe certain species specialise in certain kinds of fungi. I wanted to extend our knowledge of the life cycles and basic biology and ecology of them. I wanted to clarify the food of the larvae and I wanted to assess the contribution that the beetles were making to the dispersal of these important mycorrhizal fungi. So to undertake such a study, I needed a collaborator and Neil Bowger at the herbarium was um, a keen participant in the study. So it was my job to get the beetles and to look for bits of fungi in the burrows. And I was also attempting to get the droppings from the adult beetles. So each time I'd collect a beetle, I'd put it in a clean glass vial and hopefully it would produce droppings, which I could then pass on to Neil to examine under his microscope and from the droppings he would be able to tell me, at least to some degree, what kind of fungus the beetle had been feeding on. So to collect beetles I used basically two methods, light trapping because of their propensity to come to light, and on the left is a simple lantern pitfall set up, so the beetles will often land near the light and then crawl towards it, so this is a basin buried flush with the ground and the beetles drop in over the edge and the disc stops them flying out again. And when that worked okay, I then managed to borrow some alternated light traps over on the right. We've got a buried bucket with a funnel in the top, um, a light over it held up in some clear plastic veins. It's powered by a battery running through a timing mechanism. So that captured flying beetles. But then there was a question of digging them out of their burrows. And um, this is a picture of a South African colleague of mine. He's a scarab beetle specialist and he'd spent a lot of time digging the burrows of South African earth borer beetles, all to no avail. So um, I thought I don't want to feel as disappointed as he obviously does, having dug a three metre deep hole and got nothing. So I made sure I looked for the burrows in shallow sands. And my digging was rather more civilised. So um, I would dig very carefully, first digging a big pit next to a burrow and then I'd work in carefully so that I could look for those bits of fungi, the beetle, any associated organisms and hopefully a brood cell. Um, I'm pleased to say that I had some help in digging burrows because so far we've dug somewhere in excess of 400 burrows. So um, Otto Mueller and Jenny Cunningham have assisted me greatly in this endeavour. So now we'll look at the results of the study and what have I learnt. First, the adult diet. 
Well, we've got um, samples from the adult beetles for about 16 different species and in all of the cases they had been feeding on a fungus of some sort. Now this is a common Perth area species and it seems to be a truffle specialist. All of the food items for this were truffle. So here's this scleroderma that I showed you earlier and the black patches are the spore bodies and large somewhat here. You can see that it's made up of black spots and here are the black spots enlarged about a thousand times under Neil's microscope. So they're quite characteristic in shape and easy to recognise. So this beetle um, was found with a number of different kinds of truffles in its burrows. So I'll just skim through these. Uh, it's cut open to show you the internal structure and on the right you've got the honeycomb structure showing there. The spores occur inside those little cavities. Here's a very different type that doesn't look like a, a fungus from the outside. It just looks like a lump of earth and roots. And if you put it near your nose, you know it's a truffle. And the, spore, whoop, the spores are quite different in shape, as you'll see. Yet another kind, this particular kind of truffle is adapted for mammal feeding because it's got a crusty outer coat beneath which there's a layer of powdery spores. So as a, a mammal chews through that crusty outer coat, it flings the dry spores all over the place so they come out of their feeding with a, a greyish muzzle. And um, I found beetles feeding on these also covered with the greyish powder. They were grist to their mill as well. And a fifth kind where we got the, the truffles growing in the soil near the burrows. We got bits of truffle lower left out of their burrows. Um, we got faeces from the beetles and so we're able to tie it all together. So a number of species were found to feed on truffles but up at Charles Darwin Reserve, which is a semi-arid habitat, we found something else going on. In this particular patch of ground, um, which was near a camping area, there were 10 species representing six genera and they were there in numbers, so there was something about that particular patch that they really liked, and I'm not sure what it was. But we got faeces from six, I think it was six species, representing three genera, and none of them were truffle fungi. They were of quite a different kind. It's called glomeralian fungus. Now, glomeralian fungi can take different forms, but in this case, the beetles had been eating single large spores attached to this mycelium, the, the fine threads that you'll just make out here. So these were in amongst the sand grains and as the beetles were feeding on them, their droppings uh, over there, let start again, in their feeding they were ingesting a lot of sand grains with the food. Now these are relatively big spores. In the biggest cases you can actually see them with the naked eye. Here are some of the droppings and you can see the sand grains that are embedded in it. It would be particularly scratchy to pass, I would imagine. And particularly in the case of those big spores, um, we notice that they were often, or more often than not, broken up. And we thought, well, geez, these beetles seem to be breaking up the spores, maybe grinding them with the mandibles so that they may not be passing viable spores. But we looked at some of the samples where we had large numbers of smaller spores, and this is one case, and we could see that while lots of them have broken walls and the internal um, protoplasm is gone, there were others, like these um, three that are arrowed, that have intact walls and their contents are still there. So 4% of the spores of this fungus uh, were getting through in that sample and in a quite different kind of fungus we found that 12% of the spores were coming out in the faeces intact. So they are passing viable spores, well at least we hope they're viable, they're intact. Uh, they're passing them in some cases. And I should mention that all of the identified fungi can be termed mycorrhizal, so they are these important fungi that the beetles are eating and, um, and spreading the spores of. Now, to turn to the life cycle stages. When a female is carrying 
a fully developed egg, you can clearly see it because her abdomen bulges out below the, the wing cases. In an, a female that is not gravid, the abdomen is tucked up under the wings and it's you know, barely visible. So uh, realising that, um, I thought that it might be possible to recognise these heavily gravid females in the field and keep them in captivity until they laid their egg because what I was wanting to do was to hatch an egg and follow the development of the larva through. Um, now before I move on to the next slide, I just wanted to say that in developing one egg at a time, which probably takes weeks of uh, gestation, it necessitates that these beetles are going to be long lived because they've got to produce enough eggs to sustain the population. And it is possible that they only get a brief window of opportunity in the year to feed. So with the winter feeding species, perhaps they can only feed after the winter rains when the truffles appear and they can get enough nutrients to produce an egg. So maybe they live for several years. That's something that looks likely, but we need to get some data on as yet. Anyway. This beetle was heavily gravid when found in a burrow and she was transferred to a jar of damp sand and kept for a number of weeks and she did lay an egg in the bottom of a, a burrow. And that's her egg on the right. Come back. Her egg on the right. And I was able to weigh the egg and compare it with the weight of the beetle and the egg weighed 56% as much as the female that laid it. So it's a substantial investment of their, their own uh, resources into a single offspring. But in the field, um, we were looking for immature stages and this was our first find, digging away through yellow sand in an old dis disused quarry where there were lots of beetle push-ups. We happened upon the egg. And it took us a while to get over the surprise of actually finding one because we'd dug dozens of burrows to that point. But then we noticed something that confounded us. It's just plain yellow sand. There was no humus. There was no food there. So what was the larva going to feed on when it emerged? So it, it sowed um, a bit of suspicion about Henry Howden's observations. But Henry, when I contacted him and reported this, said, oh, well, it, some species do lay their egg near the provision, so you just need to be more careful. Well, it was three years before we got another chance to observe that particular species, but out on the gold fields we came upon two eggs, again, just in a cavity in bare yellow sand, and absolutely no sign of any humus that had been put near it or that was available to it. And fortunately, we got a larva as well. Now that larva is not um, in proportion to the, it's not to the same scale as the eggs. It was almost filling the cavity. So if you can imagine the larva in that cavity, it was conspicuously larger than the egg. Um, so it looked like there had been some growth after hatching. But this larva, which I'd hoped to rear it, but Within a day, um, I noticed that it was developing dark patches and fearing that it was under attack by some pathogen, I preserved it. That did allow me later to dissect it and have a look at the gut to see if there were any contents in the, the gut. It, it hadn't passed any faeces when I had it in a vial, but I thought, well, maybe they don't pass faeces until the end of feeding. But no, there was nothing in the intestine and the intestine was really, really thin and the walls of it re were really thin and it looked to me like it was non-functional. So um, I was starting to form the hypothesis that the eggs are so large and contain so much yolk that the larva doesn't need to feed on anything. It's got everything that it needs in its own body and it can just um, develop through to the adult in the plain uh, earthen cell. And lending some weight to that was the fact that we found a pupa of the species in a similar cell and two newly emerged adults also in these bare earthen cells. So at least in that species, I thought these larvae don't feed. Uh, these are some pictures of the, the head and the mouth parts. The mouth parts certainly of the larva I'm talking. They don't look like the sort of mouth parts that could grind up any food anyway. They look like mandibles that would just perhaps pick at things. 
and they might be purely defensive, who knows. Well, we did find the larva of another genus. Uh, it was found accidentally. Um, I helped Otto threw out a spade full of sand and then suddenly pounced on the heap. He'd spotted this. So we didn't see where it came from, but we immediately put it in a clean vial and kept it for 24 hours. It didn't produce any faeces. So once again, it seemed to be the same story. <coughs> and it looked very similar to that previous larva. But then this was found up at Charles Darwin Reserve. And again, it was sort of an accidental find, just shaving the walls of my pit, enlarging it. It dropped out. It appeared to have come out of a little cell, but I wasn't sure, and just a plain yellow sand cell. Now, it was a bit of a puzzle. At first I thought, oh, it's got the shape of an egg. It's just come out of the egg. But I noticed that on the hind end was this little lump, and when I examined that under a microscope, it proved to be a shed larval skin. So it wasn't a first instar. It hadn't just hatched. It had already been through one um, previous stage and had molted. It was odd, again, in that it showed no movement whatsoever. The mouth parts were very, um, what's the word for it, um, reduced, so they looked non-functional. The legs are extremely reduced, and there was absolutely no movement. So it, it appeared that it was a resting phase. But when I showed the image to Henry Howden, I said, what do you think about this one? He said, well, it's a larva, but I have no idea what sort of a larva. So we thought, oh, well, it's a larva of something else. It just happened to get in the way. And it was put aside in a dark box. And three months later, it had turned into a pupa. And I could see from the structure of the pupa, especially around the antennal area, that there was a ball-shaped structure, which made me think, blimey, it looks like it's going to be an earth borer after all. And two months later, Yes, it became an earth borer beetle, and I was able to identify the species. So there was a third genus for which we'd got some immature stages. But in all that digging, we hadn't seen anything really like uh, Henry Howden's brood cell, and I was thinking, well, he must have been wrong. Must have been. Until about a month ago, a month and a week, um, I was digging up near Eni Abba and the first burrow that I dug produced a dark body down at the end. It was darker sand and it was quite a solid mass. And uh, well, here you're looking at a, an enlargement of, of that area there. I broke open one of these lumps and there was an egg. And nearby there were adults of um, the same species, one of the same species that Henry Howden had reported on. So at last, um, they've been found. And I've been back and now I have five larvae that have been hatched from eggs, either found as larvae or hatched from eggs, and I hope that I'll be able to make some direct observations of their development. I can say already that the larvae do appear to be feeding on this dark sand, but it's nearly all sand and most of the darkness is charcoal, which I can't imagine could be a, a nutritious food. So it's going to be interesting to see what I learn in the next few weeks. Now, um, just finally, I want to mention some associated organisms. The beetles go to a lot of trouble to seal in their immature stages, and I haven't found any parasites to date. But on the adults themselves, I commonly have observed mites. They usually cling on the underside. They grasp the hairs in their mouth parts and hang on tightly. So with this one, you can see the legs are just sticking out. They're not hanging on with the legs. And sometimes you'll get a mass of these mites on the underside of the beetle. And they can be quite large, much larger than this one. So I sent some samples to a mite expert, and he said, oh, yes, we know about these mites. They're, um, they're peculiar to earth borer beetles. They're not known on anything else. But we know nothing about them, and we don't even know where to put them in the scheme of classification. So um, I thought, well, it would be worthwhile sampling these things and try to work out what their association with the beetles is. Quite often when you get insects attached to, when you get mites attached to insects, they're a non-feeding dispersal stage. 
that are just hitching a ride. They're going from A to B and usually you're going from one feeding place to another feeding place. So the mite that you get on the beetle has no functional mouth parts. But in this case, they have functional mouth parts. And my mite expert told me, well, they're, they're in the predatory mite group broadly. And so you can expect that they will get off in a brood cell and they'll be feeding on something there, maybe the, the larvae. So here's one of the mites. They vary quite a lot from species to species. Some are white, some have partial brown shields, and this is one that's got a complete brown shield over the back, and it's very glossy, so the white is a reflection of a ring light. Um, to explain what they actually do, I'll need to move on to another associated organism. Up the back ends of the beetles, where the, the uh, mating organs occur, they're sort of tucked inside the body in a sort of a pocket, um, the genital chamber, I've frequently found bundles of nematode worms. These are microscopic worms, they're less than half a millimetre long. But those that are in the genital chamber are non-feeding dispersal stages and they're known from lots of different kinds of insects that live in the soil. So I assume that they would jump off somewhere or crawl out somewhere and yes they do. And the time that I discovered that they become active was when I had a beetle in a tube with a piece of truffle. I was experimenting with whether I could get the adults to feed on pine truffles which are fairly easy to obtain, whereas native truffles are devilishly hard to find when you want them. So there was the beetle in the bottom of the tube munching away on the truffle and me looking down my microscope. And suddenly I noticed that the mites had come from the underside of the, the beetle and they were running over the, the beetle very uh, energetically. And they seemed to be stopping every now and again and there was something in their mouth parts, some little white things. And I realised that the nematodes were coming out of the back end of the beetle and they were crawling all over the surface of the beetle. Some were going out on the ends of bristles and waving around. So it appeared that they'd been activated by being enclosed with truffle. Maybe the odour of the truffle had given them the signal. Now's the time to move, boys. So I... I took some of these uh, non-feeding nematodes out of the back end of a beetle and put them in a glass vial with some uh, pine truffle spores suspended in a droplet of water and watch what happened. And they metamorphosed into a feeding stage. So this is an adult nematode and you can see that it's got a gullet and there's an intestine and here you've got spores of the, the pine truffle. Well, they went on to produce lots of eggs in the suspension. And here's a young nematode inside the eggshell. So my guess is that um, the nematode worms are food competitors for the beetles. They get into the beetles' food and maybe they spoil it. And um, by virtue of having the mites there um, that will pick up the nematodes and eat them as soon as they come out, perhaps it's keeping down the numbers. Also in the burrows uh, there were some other beetles which were food competitors. These are really tiny little beetles um, which are found in truffles. But uh, so far they're the only associated organisms. And while this may be the end of my talk for you this afternoon, hopefully it won't be the end of the tale because there's clearly lots to be studied yet. Are you thinking Jared die back? Yeah. Well that's an organism which I'm um, I don't know that it's a true fungus. I think it's something other than a true fungus. Um, does anyone, do you know Kirsten? Yeah, related to watermelons. So it's pretty yeah. similar. It has mycelia, but very similar. It's not a mole. Yeah, so these beetles don't have any association with those sort of things. I guess that's sort of things. where I was going as to whether there was some kind of connection. At least if there is a connection, I don't know about it. I mean, it's possible they could transport all sorts of microorganisms externally, um, but no, I haven't looked into anything like that. Yeah, yeah, there are so many connections in nature that yeah. you mess with one thing, you're messing with something else. It's like a, a symphony where all the little bits are necessary to all the other bits to make the whole. Yeah. Yes. 
various truffles, do they go straight for one that they can sense? Or is there a sort of random burrow all over the place? It does appear that they go straight to them. Um, but it's something, I haven't observed a beetle finding a truffle. And by virtue of the fact that they're active at night, it's very difficult. <laughs> Um, but when I'm looking at burrows, generally it's just a straight down burrow. Sometimes I've found um, side pockets up the top and it does look as if they might have been burrowing around there. But whether it's to get a truffle or whether they're sort of using the surface sand to take down to do something, like build a brood cell, um, it's really hard to say. But um, when you look at burrows in, in nature, um, it almost looks as if somebody's just thrown a handful of beetles randomly on the ground and wherever they land is where they go in. So you find a lot that are out in the open spaces and others that are right bang up against a bush, some that are in the middle of a tussock of grass. So there's no clear pattern there as to where they're burrowing. So um, yeah, I don't know much at all about how they find them, but I would imagine they're going for the scent and probably they would home in on the most concentrated part of the scent. So maybe it takes them straight to a, a truffle and then they burrow below it <coughs> and they cut the thing into pieces and take pieces down to the bottom of their burrow. So that's about as much as I can say on that one. Yes? Yeah, um, the beetles can burrow to depths of two metres or more in deep sands. Um, so how deep they will go, it's anybody's guess. It's a lot of work to dig out one that goes more than two metres. It's a lot of work to do a single metre burrow. Um, but in many cases there's a layer of hard clay or laterite gravel or something that limits how deep they go. Um, so generally they will go down to that, that layer. The truffles, um, Neil Bowger has told me that they're generally close to the surface or at least within, um, I think maybe 30 centimetres might be about the deepest you would get them. So they do take the spores much deeper, so they'll be taking them down to the lower part of root systems, and um, as well as you know, transporting them across the, the landscape. So does that, that answer that one satisfactorily? And can I ask another question? I was just remembering in South West about in the early 80s, um, there seemed to be quite a plethora of dung beetles in the forest. Um, and I believe we had a program that we were with breeding dung beetles to reduce the fly population, but mm. that doesn't seem to happen anymore. I was just wondering, that doesn't happen anymore. It like a good program to me. Yes, yes, it was a good program. Um, it's partly to do with the cost of research. It's a high cost. Um, so they introduced a number of species from elsewhere in the world which they hoped would cover the, the fly breeding season, or at least, because the main reason for the dung beetle program was to reduce the amount of cattle dung which was um, cutting down pasture growth. So if you get lots of cow pats, they're taking, they're taking up area that fresh growth can't come up through. That was the real reason for it. The fly thing was a side issue. It was just, oh, well, it's nice that they'll reduce the flies as well. Um, so they, they brought in these beetles and a number of them established well. There were some others that didn't do so well. Um, and lots of people would like to do further research to try to get beetles that will fill specific times of the year to get rid of the dung because there are some times it's taken away but there are other times it remains sitting there because beetles have their activity season and once that's over they don't do any more work so they wanted to fill all the months of the year to get rid of the cattle dung but um, it hasn't been possible to do that so the flies are still a problem and you know cattle dung is still somewhat of a problem to pastoralists and graziers. But despite people pushing to uh, 
rekindle a dung beetle program, um, governments just don't seem to be willing to, to fund it. I guess it's a question of priorities. So how many species were introduced? Uh, well, they trialled a lot of species. I couldn't tell you how many they trialled, but I think there were seven species which appeared to be useful and which were introduced. So the, the release of them um, happened and they established for a time. But it, it's not something that I was involved with directly and haven't sort of kept tabs on. And um, so, well, there are lots of people interested in dung beetle biology, but as for the economic side of it, I don't know um, if there's any work currently being done. Yes. Yeah, I think I read recently that the Ag Department, the last work they did was in around 1997, so it's actually quite a few years ago. Mm. But they are persisting, and they're just part of the ecosystem now, I guess. Um, the dung beetles are still persisting. Yeah. Yeah, some are persisting, but there are others that have fallen by the wayside, unfortunately. Yeah, and uh, I don't think I said that um, Henry Howden did his work because it was thought that the earth borers were dung beetles. There had been an Australian report of one species using cattle dung in its brood burrows, but it was just circumstantial evidence. They'd just seen the burrows near cattle dung, or was it sheep dung? So it's dangerous to make assumptions. But um, Henry disproved the, the dung, or at least he didn't, didn't verify it. He said, oh, no, it's a mistaken report. Yes? Um, WA and the South West Strait Eco-Region in particular is so, such an old landscape and so unique. And you see that really clearly with the flora here. Mm. Do you see that with the beetles as well? Are they, it's hard because there's so many, but do you find that they have unique properties that you don't find elsewhere on the planet? Uh, well, most of our earth borers are endemic, so they're found only in Australia, and lots of them have got quite confined distributions. So um, some of the, the genera, the groups <coughs> of them, are found only in Australia and some only in Western Australia. But it's a worldwide group. Um, but despite that, you know, they haven't learnt much about them anywhere else in the world. They're just such a difficult group to, to study. Well, at least they appeared to be difficult, but I think now um, that I've shown you, well, I've been able to learn this much and with some funding and some more effort, I'm sure there's a lot more we can learn about them. But of course, we've lost that economic imperative, you know, they're not dung beetles. So who's going to fund the study? It's only some benevolent person that wants to advance knowledge for its own sake. There is a yeah. commercial opportunity here, I think, <laughs> yeah. as an environmental indicator, because they clearly have a specialised food source, and that, in a way, uh, indicates the health of the soil. I work at mm. Enyabra at the moment, so oh, okay. I'm in a rehabilitating area, but, and uh, I've seen a lot of these diggings in old rehab areas, so they're a terrific indicator of yeah, that, that had occurred to me at one stage and I made contact <coughs> with an environmental officer for Aluka and mentioned the work and did they have any interest in pursuing it, but at that time they didn't. That's what I'm hoping soon we'll have sparked it up again. Yeah, well I think that that's a worthwhile thought and um, could be pursued. That if you can light trap the beetles and get faeces from them, or if you dig them out, the burrows are conspicuous, you can dig them up and then see what they've been eating and that will tell you what mycorrhizal fungi are active in the soil. Hmm. Are specific species of beetles um, choosy about their food or will they eat any, any truffle that they come across? Well, that one common species uh, where I showed you five different kinds of truffles is obviously not fussy. <laughs> but, uh, and the fact that you want you want in captivity was quite happy to eat pine truffles. Yeah, I'm not sure they were quite happy. <laughs> it was food of last resort. Yeah, food of last resort. Yeah, it went through them like a dose of salts that came out rather badly at the other end. Um, yeah, we haven't got enough information on other species to say whether some are specific to certain kinds of fungi. So when you just get ones or a couple of samples, you know, it's not good enough. So a lot more work needs to be done to 
to build up our sample size, our database. So you couldn't actually say because that beetle occurs here, then this fungus must occur here? I can't at this stage, but that may become possible down the track. Mm. Yeah. Have yes, Kirsten. Sorry. Have you got partnerships with the universities? Uh, partnerships? I tried to have some right. partnerships. <laughs> <laughs> so that was it. out of frustration. Um, not being able to get, say, Murdoch University where they've got a section looking at plant health and there were numbers of people working on mycorrhizal fungi there. Um, well, that, they were interested. They thought it was worth pursuing and they put it up as a potential student project, but no students took the bait. And that was sort of the last I heard of it. Um, I went to UWA and said, well, you know, make a good entomology project. Um, and then there's the behavioural aspect, uh, the males with the weird horns and what kind of male mating behaviour is there. It, it all came to nothing, so it was, well, damn it, you know, I'll see what I can do. <laughs> uh, Kirsten. How, how much are they coupled with a, a, a beetle eat in one sitting? Would they eat a whole one and then go on to the next one? Or? Um, clearly they can eat a whole truffle and go on to another one. Um, when I had males in the tubes with the pine truffles um, they were how big would you say maybe half a cherry size and they would just rip them apart and you know big volumes of it were going through the beetle so I think they probably get through them within a couple of days or I don't know because that's the only set of observations I've got I haven't seen them feeding on native truffles but you know, I'd like to look at the, their feeding on the native truffles. If only I could get a reliable source of them. They're not the sort of things that keep so well. Were there any others? We might be done, I think. We're done? Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>